I should be making a video. I better check just to be sure. Yeah. Appears that way. All right. So something a little slightly different. I mean, Sean Carroll's been out doing the circuit to promote his book. Um, and so they're going to have a conversation in London. Some London real. Real means, uh, you know, all the wackies. You know, holism and feel good stuff you know says <laughs> london feel good about just about anything um just feel good media tripe anyway so they're going to talk physics um so the first 20 minutes they talked about london food and uh, college campuses and blah 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 20 minutes of just wasted life um on mush so anyway so Sean Carroll uh, believes in the multiverse. He thinks that's reasonable theory of reality. That a new universe is created every time a photon diffracts somewhere. And so every single time its course gets changed, a new universe poofs into existence somewhere. Just too silly. <clears throat> but anyway, so this should be about quantum mechanics first. And we'll see. <laughs> You'll see where it goes from there. So this is where they're going to start talking about physics, I think. I'm just now picturing my aunt who's in Denver, who's in her 70s, and I'm just thinking, okay, Marianne, yep. how do we convince her that maybe learning about quantum is important? And how do you first having this, start having these conversations? You know, there's a lot of, it, it, it's just like picking a university. You know, different people will get into it for different reasons, right? I mean, there are people who just care about the fact that quantum mechanics is central to modern technology. You know, quantum mechanics... All right. Oh shit! Everything uh, big in mistake. Our <laughs> yes. Sense. Whoops. And it's very top heavy. My very few students. That, oh, okay. And that's... how would you say that anymore? So there's still, you know, a lot of people who are in the TV world have that intimidation about science that I think is, is kind of a shame. Yeah, well, it's still kind of a shame that TV is about the five minute, the spectacle. The okay, we already yeah, this Whereas is the wasted time stuff. And the answer is you're not supposed to ask those questions. Okay, here we go. It Sorry. settles into some minimum energy configuration. Okay, minimum energy configuration. And the central idea that makes quantum mechanics different is that in Newtonian mechanics, you have like... There's the pause. Let me see if the space bar works. Okay, just the planet. Yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, so anyway, this idea that you know, quantum mechanics runs the world is just such a lie. Um, it really doesn't. You don't, you don't need any of the Copenhagen interpretation or the many worlds interpretation or any of these silly interpretations. You just have to understand that light is bent by association with materials you associate light with a material and something happens to the light it changes it uh, transmits slower um, different things happen to it and that's it there's no quantum mechanics necessary um, this is all stuff Newton was observing 300 years ago there's no you know there's no quantum mechanics necessary for any of the uh, modern technology it's just a lie. Around the sun. You give me where the planet is, how fast it's moving, where the sun is, and I can tell you what it's going to do. And literally, people do this on computers, right? They simulate the future of the solar system. Right, and Kepler used to do that. In the back Kepler, of the day. yeah, Galileo. All, all, all those guys used to watch it. Yes. And that was all based on Newtonian. Right, right. It's all based on 300-year-old and 200-year-old science. Um, and you don't need any of this new modern science to do exactly the same thing with pretty much 99% accuracy. So, it's all crap. Well, Kepler was pre-Newton. Kepler pre helped inspire Newton to, right. uh, to figure these things out. Kepler figured out that planets move in ellipses, not in perfect circles. Right. And then Newton said, oh yes, with the law... Right, and, but the, the ellipses are, can be so close to a perfect circle that it doesn't make much of a difference. And the ellipse is only a byproduct of what you would argue to be the energy that had to go in in the first place. The planet is the end result of stuff going more than one direction. There was more energy going in one direction than another direction when it originally went into the system, and so well, it's an ellipse because that's how the orbit had to be created. I mean, there's always going to be a winner. You got hit by more stuff on the left side than you got hit on the right side. There'll be a subtle winner in every contest, and that's the side you'll be ellipsing in. Gravity is the inverse square law. I can predict that planets move on ellipses. That was his great triumph. <clears throat> so gravity isn't the inverse square law. Everything that comes from a, a small thing and radiates to a big thing is the inverse square law. So it's everywhere. 
in terms of motion and how things that radiate momentum radiate something that can exchange momentum that's how it's radiated generally speaking is from little points the small universe is um, conveying the movement in small portions that should be the idea of quantum mechanics is the idea that the it's all in the little chunks that are doing all the interesting things like the electron and the proton their movement dictates everything that happens that's significant has to do with an electron or a proton moving but then the difference is in quantum mechanics uh, if you talk about an electron for example okay in fact the electron that there's a classic picture of the atom that we've all seen with a little nucleus at the middle and the electrons are what look like right and that's just a guess uh, back in a period of time where there was some ignorance so just kind of like religion uh, was just a guess in ignorance you know where they didn't have any information so they just blamed everything on a god because well what else could it possibly be um, you know so they didn't have any knowledge of experiments and details and observing and they didn't have enough information to draw a rational conclusion so they drew an irrational one and here we are at another place in modern history where we know that's the habit of humankind is to get it wrong the first few times and they ought to have a little bit of discipline and know well maybe we got it wrong and so this whole idea of an atom drawn as some sort of thing with this little dead thing in the center and this stuff buzzing around um, it doesn't have to be the truth there's no hard evidence indicating that is the truth and yet they just keep preaching at it and building on that notion as if it's a fact when they don't know if it's a fact little planets almost just like a little solar system right, right. so that's a very comforting picture we've seen pictures of the solar system here's the atom they look very similar perfect circle it's all happy and perfect that's and right <laughs> and as it turns out that picture of the atom is complete bs it's not what atoms really right and they're <laughs> and we know that because an electron uh, zooming around an atom would give off light all of the light that we see here oh, in this come room come on electrons, it doesn't down, work now radiation Dang. and therefore the electron would spiral into the middle okay so his argument is is but that's only if your theory of of the function is some sort of gravitational theory or a theory that includes some kind of drag or some kind of other mechanism to force it to do all that kind of stuff and so they're just inventing some fake notion that's in some fake field um that doesn't allow that to happen um, and, um, you know, that the, the somehow the, the velocity of the electron is counteracting some other force when, no, the, what's counteracting the attraction is the repulsion the electrons have for each other. Again, they, they just, they chose some sort of, it's not even an electric model, you know, the electron moving, um, but it is in their mindset because they think somehow the moving electron means something different than the standing still electron besides the fact that yes the electron has a field around it and it will interact with things just like the earth has essentially a gravitational field it's just the inverse field it's a come to me field rather than a repelling field um, but all that can be understood you don't need all this mush well, it would lose energy it's not a stable configuration so the answer as to why electrons stay in their atoms is that they're not little particles moving on orbits. They're waves. They're a cloud that is spread out and sort of settles in. To some so, so this is the new version, right? This has only happened in the last 10 years that they've decided that all of a sudden now they're going to make, you know, electrons into non-things that have real positions in space and instead just turn them into some sort of bizarre thing just somehow does go around but it really doesn't because it doesn't have a location so it's everywhere and nowhere I mean it's so bad and they preach it as if oh we have real hard evidence that this is the truth and they don't have anything like that they have they have nothing really as evidence a minimum energy configuration so this is you know we're talking about now 1910s people figure this out if you think about electrons as little clouds everything's okay right the problem is when you look at an electron, when you shoot so I, I don't st show me the 1910 document that talks about electrons as little clouds. I don't think so. I don't think that was any the the 99 out of 100 physicists of that time thought that electrons were little clouds. I don't think so. I think that's just more of this hyperball, this this tell the fake story instead of the real story.
an electron through a detector, it, you don't see a big cloud spreading out. You see a particle moving along a line, right? And believe it or not, the, the thing that, pe that physicists convinced themselves of in the 1920s was, here's how to describe reality. When you're not looking at it, the electron is a wave. And then when you look at it, it's a particle. Um, so anyway, yes, that's when the subject of, of whether what, what it is came up and then they settled reluctantly much later. Einstein made some sort of a concession that yes, well, it's a particle in the way of thing and yeah, 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 sometimes this and sometimes that. And so sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't and blah, 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 blah. But yeah, you know, <laughs> they don't have anything. They have, they, they're, they're just grasping and they talk as if they've, got like some real clear path here's the clear evidence points in this clear direction and it's nothing like that it's just this is the way the majority of the physicists decided to become um to, to shove a bunch of of wooey notions you know angel-like functions into science so they're just saying oh uh, we're atheists except well we're not really atheists because we believe in these little special powers. They want to give everything special powers. And people like Einstein said, oh, come on. Like, you know, th even if that's true, that can't be the final answer. Let's, let's try to do better. But people like Niels Bohr... And his even like, if that's true. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, again, he's... You, you reluctantly... He reluctantly concedes that, oh, yeah, that's the evidence. It sometimes looks this way and that way. So I'll concede the evidence. But, yes, I'm not, I'm not buying into this mush. I'm not convinced that's the whole story because the story is a real story somewhere i mean einstein knew the thing was is mechanical it's a machine and the machine has to have parts friend said no no it works let's move on okay okay and there was like a name for that theory that when so you copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. and when you observe something it fundamentally changes it when yeah. people understand that concept but like you said it feels like it's a well what do you together. mean so the question is like what counts as yeah. observing right does it have to be a person could it be a cat, <laughs> as Schrodinger famously wondered? Uh, could it be a video camera? Yeah, well, the cat isn't observing. That's, that's the whole problem. You put a cat in a box, and somehow there's no observer that watches the cyanide fall, and the cat dies. <laughs> you know, it's a silly thought experiment. It doesn't mean anything. Again, all, that's all they have is silly thought experiments, because they don't have any real evidence that there's any such thing as this superposition of states of being, like you can be two things at the same time. There's just no evidence of it, and why they chose it or why they choose to be so arrogant and obnoxious in their preaching that this is somehow a proven theory or well demonstrated by evidence, when it's not. Like, what if I don't look at it very closely? Does right. that count? You just look at and it. the answer is, you're not supposed to ask those questions. The answer is, quantum mechanics seems to, in the way that we teach it to our students at MIT or Caltech, the act of observation is a primitive, fundamental notion. Now, that's kind of silly and absurd and shouldn't be... Well, again, there's no, there's no point arguing. It isn't about observing. It's about interacting. Period. The photon always does something when you interact with it. Okay, you change it, you break it, and then you can remake it later. And that's all there's evidence of. There's no evidence of any, the photon isn't where it was, it isn't going where it's going. It, it, those rules are all consistent. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the whole system is conservative and that you can really follow the path you can actually draw the path and follow the path and understand the path. And you don't have to think that it doesn't know where it was when it was in all those locations. It knew where it was. It was somewhere. I mean, this is just so bad. They get away with this. Talking like this is the, the real theory made out of real hard evidence. No. It's made out of their inability to... to to, to understand their obligation is to prove something and to prove it you have to play with the experiment a little bit and see what the details are again they never describe interferometers when they talk about the pattern they never point out that yeah you get the same pattern if you just put some dust on a mirror and shine a light through it you'll get the same pattern you don't need a fancy interferometer the final answer so people like me are trying to do better than that but that's the mystery that's the reason why quantum mechanics is difficult to understand because it involves words like measurement and observation that are just not very well defined okay and i remember being taught <coughs> that yeah it's a particle and it's a wave and it depends on the time 
and growing up in a Newtonian world as a kid and living in the in this reality, whatever you want to call this, it that just doesn't make any sense. It yeah. Really, I mean, not right. So and so, why are you clinging so hard to it? Why are you so desperate to say this is the truth, though? This is the hidden reality. Why? Why? It can only be for a wooey reason. It can only be because you don't want the truth, which is there's a mechanical system and mechanical things are happening and it's all deterministic and there's no surprises here for anybody who's smart. There is no surprises. Everything is quite predictable and quite understandable. And you don't want to live in that world because then you have to concede your dumb, stupid robots playing dumb, stupid games. Now it feels like you're in a religion class, right? <laughs> yeah. Faith. Okay, so so and you're laughing about it. Yeah, that's exactly what you sound like. Exactly. I can make a huge correlation between pre-Darwin and this conversation and how the religious people just don't want to accept. And that they're still sitting here 200 years after Darwin. They're still sitting on this planet pretending that it doesn't happen. That uh, genetics doesn't have anything to do with it. That, uh, that there isn't this, uh, you know, mechanical process that led to our existence. I mean, you're and you're doing the same thing to physics. Well, it's it's very interesting because psychologically, the reason why it's hard for physicists to really come to terms with quantum mechanics is. Everything in so they keep saying it's hard for physicists to do when obviously all the physicists have done it. They're, they're, they're saying, okay, I can live with that nonsense. As long as you give me a formula that has a couple of variables in it that don't have anything to do with quantum mechanics, fine. I can do my little math and blah, 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 blah. And so, yeah, the fact that we know there's a probability, I throw some dice. So the physicist will admit when I throw a pair of dice at a, at a table that there's real physics that are going to decide what shows up at the end and that you can follow the path, and that you could reduce the path to, say, the last bounce, and you could sort of maybe even simulate that in a computer, and you could make predictive results where you could predict the outcome pretty reliably if you know where the two dice are, what their foot face is, is up when they hit the last bumper or something. And the computer probably could handle that and probably come up with a, uh, a routine where it gets the right answer more often. Okay, not, not every time, but it's more probable. It can predict. Um, so, so you know it's a physical process. That the the randomization is just has to do in the number of variables. You've increased the number of variables, therefore you've increased the the number of uh, possible ways the outcome can be produced. And by doing that, it it's essentially randomizing the outcome. But there's no intrinsic random in the in the playing of dice. Yet they think because there's probabilities in these other things, and we can't see the dice. Uh, that this this other board that dice are being thrown at with the photon hits a surface, it's no different. Yeah, there's an outcome that you can be pretty certain of probabilistically, but we can also know that the outcome is the outcome. It depends on where the photon goes. Does the photon travel right next to the slit or does the photon travel down the middle? And that those two places will produce a different outcome. They want you to believe that it doesn't matter whether the photon goes right next to the surface or whether the photon's right down the middle, that those two photons have the same probability of doing something. Well, they don't have the same probability. They're dice thrown in completely different ways and they have a different possible outcome. Jeez. Our scientific intuition says the world is what it looks like. We look at the world and we see it. No, you're doing that. They're the ones doing that, right? They they see an on-off pattern, and because uh, water interference creates a little bit of an on-off pattern, you know, agitated water, calm water, agitated water, calm water. So they think every time they see that pattern, on-off, on-off, oh, it must be some sort of interference. They're the ones doing the, it seems like, it it looks like. And, and just it all has to do is look a little bit like it, and they'll say it's the same thing. The same mechanism. That's the joke. And the whole point of quantum mechanics is that we look in the, at the world and what we see is something a little bit different than what the world really is. And so that's very hard to reconcile when we say... So again, that doesn't even make any sense as a statement. You should be talking that we see something deeper and, and more revealing. Uh, no, you just, you're, just, you're, just, you're just sitting here looking at it and it's too complicated and so you're trying to make it simple by saying, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to take the the fact that there are physical dynamics involving these little tiny particles that I can't see, and there are trillions of them, and I'm just going to turn that into a probability equation and say that's what they're behaving as. They're obeying probability. They're not obeying the rules of their location. 
Uh, I mean, you're just averaging something that's a, that's got a trillion little bits in it, and you're saying it's all one thing. It's one general thing. It's not one general thing. You know, is it that the true reality is something very, very different, and we have to give up on the idea that we see the world directly? Or is this set of words about waves and clouds that we use to describe reality just a crutch, and what we see really is the reality? And so that's a debate that's still ongoing. Well, obviously, we don't see the reality. So the whole thing is moot. If we could see it, then I could just show you the picture and say, see, you're full of crap. All right. This photon went closer to the slit. This one went further away. That's why they went different locations. It's because of what, how, what they interacted with. They hit real surfaces. They bounced. They did real things based on real physics. Now, you're mentioning 1910, 1920, when this stuff starts to get funny. Is that because of Einstein? Is it because also we were able to start to measure things a little bit closer and we started having access to nucleuses and soon-to-be atomic bombs? Yeah, very like much. That? You know, almost all the great revolutions in physics are driven by better data, one way or the other, right? Better experiments. And there were two ideas that really bug people in the early days of the 20th century. All right, so this is where they really tell a, a big giant lie, right? Because the Young Experiment was 1801. So it's 100 years before that. And Newton had already done Newton's rings 200 years before that. And that's the real history. So this mystery, they didn't get any new information. There wasn't anything. They cite now the Young Experiment as the some kind of critical experiment to their arriving at this this wooey wave particle duality nonsense they gained absolutely no information no new information was gleaned and they just got tired of being boring and having to say we don't know and so instead of saying we don't know we haven't figured it out yet um, we don't have a, a physical mechanism they decided to draw conclusions and so they did the wave particle duality and then they did the silly bent space thing Two just really stupid ideas. One was what's called uh, black body radiation. So if you just take an object and you heat it up to some temperature, there's a wonderful feature that every object, no matter what color it is, no matter what shape it is, no matter what the material is made of, if it's at a constant temperature, like you put it in an oven and heat it up, it glows in exactly the same way. Every single object. And there's a very, very clear spectrum that it has, a certain amount of red light, a certain amount of blue light, etc. So you can try to predict that, theoretically, using the tools that you had in the year 1900, and you get it wildly wrong. <clears throat> so, yes, and then we get it wildly wrong because the obvious thing you you got to understand going in is that the whole thing about what kind of radiation is going to be admitted is completely dependent on what the relationship is between electrons and pro protons and how quickly you can actually move an electron in to create... Uh, a frequency. So you have to move the electron back and forth, essentially, to create energy at a frequency. And there's a limitation to how fast you can move electrons, is the simple truth. There's a physical limitation. It won't allow you to move it any faster or it breaks, so to speak. It's like having a stick in water. And you can swish it back and forth at a certain speed, but if you try to swish it too fast, you know, move too much too quickly, the stick will break. That's the rule. So they were anticipating that the stick is indestructible and that I can go as fast as I want and the stick will never break. Well, that was a really ignorant and stupid assumption. So anybody who thought, well, there should be all this very high frequency radiation being admitted, well, they should have been able to figure out that, well, no, it's really hard to create a high frequency electron that's stable. So Max Planck comes along and he says, well, maybe when the light is emitted, even though it's light, even though our friends here in England, like uh, Maxwell and Faraday, told us that light is a wave in the electromagnetic field, maybe when it's emitted, even though it's a wave, it's emitted in little chunks. Well, they didn't say it was a wave in any other context than their belief in an ether. So again, why don't you admit the truth, okay? Maxwell believed there was an ether, and the ether was what's being, the jello is being vibrated, and that's the creation of the waves. And again, that analogy always forces you to say, well, then what's the medium made out of? Um, it doesn't get you, it doesn't, it doesn't give you a get out of jail free card to say the word ether. Right? Like a little bit here, a little bit there, rather than smoothly and continuously. And with that out of the blue idea, he fit the data perfectly. But everyone's like, what does that mean? And it was Einstein who actually said, you know, the difference is the following. Uh, it didn't fit any data perfectly besides the point that the mechanism for creating those higher frequencies would require a preposterous amount of energy that you can't supply to the system. 
uh, Planck said the equivalent of, I have a coffee maker that gives me coffee in one cup increments all the time. Okay, I push the button, I get one cup of coffee, and that's one little photon, one little particle of energy. And Einstein came along and says... So again, there's no, there's no one little particle of energy outside the context of understanding for us to see it, for us to detect the photon. There has to be a number of those. Our eye requires six to nine of those coffee cups. And if there's not that many, we don't see it. Does it mean the coffee cups don't exist? So there's only four coffee cups at the right frequency. We don't see it as a photon. It doesn't exist to our knowledge. Uh, does that mean the four coffee cups aren't real energy anymore? They aren't real something? They aren't really going to hit the surface and cause effects? Well, of course they are. And they just negate all of that. They just ignore that as the truth. The thing we call a photon is a ray that has a length. And they keep ignoring the fact that the length of that ray is everything to what it's going to cause the electron, for example, to do. Because if the ray is really long, and it really does travel and hit electrons, the more it hits them, the faster the electrons go. And the truth is you can eventually get the electrons to be moving almost as fast as the ray is moving. And therefore, the ray is going to keep the electron moving for quite a while because the drag the electron is feeling as it's moving, it's plowing into a field of energy, it's being dragged down, but at the same time, it's still being constantly pushed. And that's what they call all of these 400 nonsense particles are really just electrons or protons being pushed at a speed. Coffee only exists in one cup increments. <laughs> so he said it's not just that light is emitted by a hot object, one particle at a time, but light is particles, is what he said, which is sort of completely incompatible with everything we thought we had figured out in the 1800s. So that's the first sort of particle versus wave-like thing. And then this thing with the atoms, the electrons in the atoms, people are like, why don't electrons fall in? And uh, Louis de Broglie, a French physicist, said, well, if... De Broglie, but anyway... Um... <laughs> yeah, he made up this fake idea that uh, we're going to make frequency the same thing as momentum. We're going to make those two things, the F and the P or whatever they use for momentum, the same term. When they're not the same thing, they're two fundamentally different things. And things that are just moving at a constant speed uh, don't have a frequency by themselves. The individual thing does not have a frequency. A car going down the road does not have a frequency. Yet yeah, they're going to claim it does. They're going to calculate one for it um, based on a stupid assumption that there's some sort of equal sign between frequency and momentum when there isn't. That's only true for the circumstance that something that's in a tension, like a, a trampoline or something, and you can push it in, that if you push slower than its rebound speed, Okay, you're not going to be able to push it very deep, but if you push faster, then it can rebound back, then you can push much deeper, you can move it further. And that's the fact of electrons. So because electrons are what we see move, we our detectors all need to see an electron move for us to detect anything. And because electrons move based on being pushed out of their tension, certain frequencies will do that and certain other frequencies won't. So if my frequency is too slow, there's no way I can tip the thing over because I it keeps tipping back before I hit it again uh, you know I've made these analogies over and over and they're so simple and they're not getting it that's as simple as having a pendulum swinging I have to hit it if I want to make the pendulum swing more I have to hit it when it's moving the same direction my force is moving and if I hit it when it's moving the opposite direction I'm not going to get more swing out of the pendulum I'm going to get a lot less swing and it's that simple the truth is that simple. So this is all about something deeply obvious that these people are hiding, that these people don't want to show you. They don't want you to see. They don't want you to even inquire for a simple answer because a simple answer means what they're doing isn't all that mysterious and, you know, it's not some, the, 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 it's like just figuring out the witch doctor's trick. You know, he does all the mumbo-jumbo and all the da dancing, and then he puts an aspirin in your drink. <laughs> you know, so there's no magic. Einstein says waves can be like particles. Maybe the particles, the electrons, can be like waves. And then that also worked, but, you know, it was clearly... So again, the, the silly thing, again, something 
deeply obvious about particles is that a group of particles, like a group of soldiers, can look like waves of soldiers. A group of bullets can look like a wave of bullets. But a wave can't really look like a particle. The sign that something is moving toward the same direction, but reconciling everything took more years than that. Yeah. Okay. We keep mentioning Einstein. Tell us about Einstein. I mean, everyone knows the images, and everyone knows the myth. But what, what, was, what was he really? And what did... He was a shitty father, <laughs> obviously. A lousy husband. Um, and... Um, and the rest of his life, he was a, you know, kind of a meek um, person um, who was pretty good at quipping, you know, pretty smart, no doubt. But, um, yeah, it, bad idea. He had, and what did he question? So Einstein was a smart cookie, as it turns out. I, I think, if anything, this is almost going to sound silly, he's underrated. <laughs> okay. And he did win the person of the century and the whole bit. But we had this image of Einstein, you know, in the early 20th century with relativity. Um, you know, he came up with space-time, and then space-time is curved, and that's gravity, which eventually led other people to things like black holes and the Big Bang, and it's a big deal. Right, it's a big deal not proven by anything real. So the most, the only way that theory got proven was to have this Eddington experiment show up at the right time uh, and say, yes, light is bent by the Einstein amount, um, not the Newton amount. Um, and the only reason why Einstein created a different amount of bending was is because he did a thought experiment and figured out that if I had a light clock, if I could possibly control photons in a spaceship, and I bounced them back and forth, that they would look like they were moving down, like they were bending down because the spaceship was moving away. And he had to make that the same truth for gravity. Even though the two forces are different, fundamentally, in how they're pushing things, um, we're going to pretend it's the same everywhere and so Einstein had to make the the gravity do the same thing as the spaceship is doing in that we had to have this image of gravity pushing us up uh, rather than us falling down and that photons would bend in the gravity appear to bend and one of the fundamental things about gravity in general relativity is that it's more or less a one-man show Einstein was the only guy who was really pushing on that and he figured it out. Whereas with quantum mechanics, So again, he says he figured it out as if this is a real puzzle piece and it was really put into the puzzle and it really belongs there when, in hindsight, the Eddington experiment's never been repeated using the same technology, never been repeated using better technology, um, the never done from space, even though we have thousands of satellites in space right now that have cameras capable, that have enough of a magnifying lens on them to do the experiment. None of them do it. No, none. Nothing. No evidence confirming Einstein's theory. None. No duplicate. The, one of the principles of science is do the experiment and then duplicate it. Do it again. Repeat it a few times to prove it. Well, they haven't done that, and yet they're claiming, oh, no, this is a written fact. This is We can chip this right in the, the rock of truth. Nope. Not even close. Annex. It took 20 people, you know, years to, to really get this right, arguing with each other back and forth all the time with many different contributions from many different people. So you can't point to one person and give them the credit for quantum. Mechanics. Right. It's monkeys at the typewriter, and they just keep typing bullshit, and then finally somebody spells bullshit right, and they say, ah, bullshit, we got it, bullshit. It's not a legitimate theory. It's cobbled together out of a bunch of wrong assumptions and stupid notions. Uh, and again, uh, regarding something deeply obvious, which is, it's really stupid to think there's the little universe is the complex place, where complicated, wooey things are happening, where the ESP and all of these you know, radars and all kinds of, all these little particles have all kinds of functions and they can do all kinds of mathematics and all kinds of probability. No, they can't do any of that. They're the really dumb robots. We're the fancy robots, okay? But <laughs> just as robotic, but yeah, we have a lot more interactions taking place. The interactions for the little universe is every single little bit has a singular little inner reaction, one interaction at a time. One little quanta of interaction at a time. It's in the same way that you can give Einstein the credit for general relativity. So just for that reason alone, he deserves a lot of credit and he gets it. 
But then there's this story that you will hear that Einstein couldn't quite cope with quantum mechanics, right? So by the time quantum mechanics... Yeah, by the time quantum mechanics took its next step into wooiness and decided, well, God isn't enough. We need, we need a holy ghost. So let's make a, the holy ghost of entanglement. And yes, that threw Einstein uh, off the boat because he was saying, oh, I'll go along with a lot of this bullshit, okay, but I'm not wearing that pink dress and I'm not going to carry that little spinning thingy and I'm not, I'm not going to play this silly tart game that you're playing. Um, this is just stupid, spooky, action, wooey bullshit. Now, even though Einstein's own theory of relativity is spooky, action, bullshit, um, gravity is some magical thing that just magically happens to things. They just magically, the electrons and the protons just sit there and magically say, I'm in a bent geodesic, I must fall this way. No force has to hit me. I just magically sense that I have to go somewhere. I mean, his was spooky action at a distance. He didn't improve on Newton at all. Put into his final form is around 1927. And there's this image of Einstein as an old man who can't quite keep up with the times. Now, he's like 48 years old. <laughs> so, so I don't want to be told that he's an old man at the time. But also, that image is wrong because Einstein understood quantum mechanics better than anybody, including the people who are given credit for inventing it. So this is a, a preposterous misstatement of reality in the sense that no Einstein didn't believe any of this crap. Um, your your gravitational wave nonsense, all of these theories that you say have something to do with Einstein. Even Einstein rings, right? I mean, Einstein wasn't around to point out to you that can't be an Einstein ring because guess what? You can't see Einstein rings in space because they're this thin. Okay, that's how thin they are. They're this thin. You can't see them. All right impossible and yet you're going to claim you've got a picture of one I mean Einstein didn't believe any of this much they believe it says that he just right, I won't say any of it I'm just saying the whole the whole woo the, the extra whatever the 70 percent of the woo Einstein wasn't buying any of it willing to accept that it was done that it was you know he wrote a famous paper can the quantum mechanical description of reality be considered complete he thought there was more to the story and we should keep looking. And I think he was right about that. I think that the stories that we were telling ourselves in the 1920s are woefully incomplete. So I do think that, you know, he had some ideas near the end of his life that turned out not to work, but we've all had ideas that turned out not to work. Uh, I think that his judgment was really, really good on these issues. I wonder how a guy in Switzerland on his own without... Well, see, Einstein tried to base a unification theory on bent space. And, you know, just isn't going to work because... Bent space is a silly explanation because we already know, again, the whole idea of why would bent space be moving at the speed of light? Why would why would it why would its functions be limited like that? You know, what's the mechanical reason for this delay in its function? Laboratories came up with this, or is it because it was a complete paradigm shift in the way of looking at things? I mean, do you ever think about that? Well, you know, Einstein had, in 1905, he had what is called his miracle year, where he has, you know, four different papers published in the same journal. Anyway. Yes, and some of them are really good, like Browning motion and figuring out, uh, you know, spectral resolutions and lots of, I mean, he sort of demonstrated why you can't see with a microscope. It's at least to lots of good stuff in there. You know, so yes, one of the papers really good. Maybe two. But yeah, the two relativity ones, forget about it one of which should have won the Nobel Prize. And we do think about that. How in the world that happened? He was not even a professor at the time. He was a patent clerk, right? And maybe you can say, well, being a patent clerk gave him some more free time because, you know, it was not a very difficult job. It was enough, enough to pay the rent, basically. Um, but no, you know, somehow he had this way of figuring out exactly which parts of the phenomena were relevant and which parts were irrelevant, which parts you could throw away and which parts you could keep. In fact, his first major contribution to relativity there's special relativity that is all the business about the speed of light being constant and the clocks and so forth. Uh, that's my chance. Yes, the, 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 and that observation is perfectly lucid to recognize that the speed of light is a constant you can depend on. That's the thing that's showing you the real universe all the time. It always does the same thing. The photon, no matter how fast an object is moving, the light leaves at exactly the speed of light in every direction, in the sense that the light itself escapes the object. It's already moving the speed of light and it just continues. So it's like a captured bird in a, in a cage. 
and you can move the bird and the cage together and the bird can circle around in the cage but it's obviously going to fly more in one direction than it's going to fly in the other direction because you're moving the cage but it never hits the wall of the cage but it's still flying the same speed and then you just open the cage and you let the bird out that's what a photon does the photon doesn't gain momentum it doesn't you can't change it and so it's the solid part of the universe um, you can really rely on it to tell you what's happening so in the spaceship when you're moving and the light appears to bend that's really just telling you you're actually moving because the photons have a constant speed and the fact that the ship is leaving the photons means you know you're leaving the photons you're actually moving in the universe and so the light clock is the universal speedometer unfortunately it only detects speeds that are really really fast and we can't make a physical material thing go fast enough to see the light um, um, do its straight line and we force the line to curve by moving the surface Oh five, and then it was ten years later, nineteen fifteen, that he says, "Well, maybe the space time is curved, and you get gravity." Special relativity was not just Einstein; he was building on things that other people did. In fact, his major contribution was to say, "We can simplify everything." There was this idea: there was the ether, this invisible field that filled all of space, and light was propagating through the ether. And it took Einstein just to say, "If you remove the word ether here everywhere, and you just say light propagates through empty space." You get all of the phenomena correctly described in much simpler terms. Well, well to... how is it simpler? It's simpler because it's more vacuous. So instead of calling God, God, you just call it him that is him. All right. So instead of having a name, you just call him him that is him. You know, you know this is just bullshit. This semantics. It, it, Einstein conceded it's the same thing. So all you did is made space into some sort of jello. You made it into a substance. You made it into something physical, all right? That wasn't physical. So you can now perpetuate things through it. So now you can vibrate through it. Um, but that's all you did. It's exactly the same thing. And so this semantic game, oh, well, we're running away from the word ether. Why? Because it sort of demonstrates what you're saying is that you're not going to account for the real effect of forces. You're just going to pretend that the force needs a medium when there's no reason to believe it does. You can't account for the, the force. You can't see it, and so you say the force doesn't exist. Just like in, in electrodynamics, they call it a virtual photon. They know it essentially behaves the same way, and, yet they, and they know it must be there, and yet they call it a virtual photon because they don't have any mechanics, because they don't have any understanding of where the force really comes from. They don't have any way to make it. The magnet doesn't get lighter. Nothing changes, so they can't say, well, where are the virtual photons coming from? They have nowhere to make them, create them. Um, and now they're so close to doing that anyway, because now they say empty space just pops these particles into existence. Have to do is give up on the idea that there's an absolute space and an absolute time, which is a lot to give up on. It's just a genius. Yes, and it's a silly thing to give up on, and it's just nonsensical because of the fact that it's so reliable. There's just absolutely no evidence that time burps or skips or does any of that no evidence whatsoever that you can ever add that there's some dimension that time is is existing in that is following some dimensional rules it's just a function and the function is dictated by the speed of light that's the thing telling you that time is constant right there it's right in front of you simple truth and you're just this is just nonsense something deeply nonsensical giving up on the right things mm, wow and that's that that probably is, is is the history of great movements in human technology right so this is like the history of a great religion so yes yes you're you've snookered them all they're all falling for it just like the silly christians and the silly muslims and the silly whatevers they all fall for this silly story um, and you think it's a great moment in our history. It's a great failure of intelligence, the, a, a preposterous failure. It's so, it's so overt and obvious it's a failure. You're disobeying your own principles of science. Um, you're going where Newton wouldn't have gone. A, Newton didn't have the, you know, you don't have the courage to be a Newton and say, I don't know. And you don't know. 
That's the simple truth. But it is knowable. You just have to think about it. <laughs> and you haven't given it any thought. You just bought the, the silly story and then gave up on, oh, evolution's too complicated. I don't want to do that. This God answer is so simple. I love it. Understanding the people who know what to look at and people that can also walk away from previous assumptions. You know, it's fascinating to me because there's no one right way to be a great physicist. There are different physicists who have very different styles. Even just to Caltech, where I am, in the 1960s, we had both Richard Feynman and Murray Gell-Mann, uh, who were the best theoretical physicists in the world at the time, but very, very different styles. And styles come along with different you know, predispositions, different feelings, different intuitions about how nature is going to work. And the dirty little secret... Of the yeah, and the dirty little secret is just these people, their, their fundamental premise is don't try to get the right answer. Just get an answer that works. Theoretical physics is it's not an algorithm. There's not a way to go from the data to the correct, to the correct story. You're going to guess. You're going to say, well, maybe it's this way. Maybe it's that way. Different people will make different guesses. And right, and you test your guesses with experiments, and you use experiments to prove them. And you don't use some experiment where you don't even know how the thing actually functions. So, again, all the entanglement experiments are all based on polarization film you know, and photons. They're all based on that. And you have to have an understanding of how the polarization filter works to be able to have any kind of rational assumptions about what is actually taking place. So again, it's I made this argument, but it could be as simple as, um, you know, I could make an assumption about a jail cell, and I'm going to throw frisbees, right? And I'm going to throw frisbees through the bars of the jail cell, and I can know that, you know, if I think about it, I can say, okay, I, I'll make an assumption. Uh, you know, I'm going to throw half of them this way, and I'm going to throw half of them this way. And, um, you know, clearly the ones going this way will go through the bars, and clearly the ones going this way won't get through the bars, and so there, it's 50-50. Well, if I did that, I'd be wrong, right? Because I didn't, I didn't count on the fact that sometimes when I throw it this way, it actually hits a bar. It doesn't get through. So it's not 50-50. Some portion of the ones I throw this way won't get through. Now, all the ones going this way aren't going to get through. But some portion of the ones going this way also won't get through. So it's not 50-50. So the assumption destroys the, the wrong assumption, destroys the validity of the experiment. Because I do the experiment on the other side of the bars, I find out that, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, these proportions are wrong. And if I really thought about it, I'd understand why they were wrong. And that gets into the whole why they believe in entanglement. They, I think they believe in entanglement for, for a, a wrong assumption that's that obvious. The only reason why their experiment is giving them an indication of a difference that isn't where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be 75% and it's 85%. Well, the reason why it's 85% is, is because some of the frisbees you threw the right way didn't get through the bars. It's that simple a mistake. And you're saying these people are going to talk about something deeply hidden when they can't even see something that obvious. In different historical circumstances, different guesses are going to turn out right. Like Einstein in 1905 made all the right guesses. His intuition was spot on again and again. And then when it came... <laughs> and the evidence is this flawed Eddington experiment that's, you know, history will put it where it's supposed to be, which is junk. It was a garbage experiment. The weather sucked. It was a horrible experiment. Should have never been used as a as a as a foundation, to, and it never repeated. Even with all this advanced technology, not even attempted from space, which is a, a ludicrous joke. I mean, really, one of the most famous experiments in the history of science, and the NASA, none of these places have ever even attempted it. I think the simple argument is they attempted it and they didn't find it and they're like, well, we must have done it wrong. I think that's the simple truth. So, you know, the 1930s and 40s when he was trying to unify gravity with electromagnetism, all of his guesses were wrong. And he didn't become dumber, you know. Uh, it was just a different time and different problems were ripe for being solved at that time. Okay. And well, he was wrong-headed in the sense that there's no point in trying to make bent space into something that's moving electrons because it's just stupid. It's not the right answer. You mentioned Richard Feynman. I mean, he's kind of a legend at MIT and Caltech. My dad actually took that freshman physics class from him. I think it's oh, 61 yeah. okay. or something. Yeah, I had one. Richard Feynman's old desk. Really? At Caltech. Oh, yes. my gosh. <laughs> make sure that's not stolen from you. Like, There's a little cool. sign on at the bottom that says Feynman's desk. Okay. Right? So he's quite a legend over there. But again, a really forceful personality. I mean, personalities matter. 
because a personality can drive forward an idea, a concept. I mean, look at Stephen Hawking, look at Feynman, look at Einstein. Yeah. Uh, yes, right. All junk, 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 junk. So yeah, so that theory again. This is their theory that somehow it's important to have a personality because that's going to make the or break the physics. Well, it should have been physics that was broken. And the only thing that saved it was the personality. Because Richard Feynman can say something stupid like "Don't think, just calculate," you know. Don't don't really ponder why it happens. Just accept that it happens. You know, you're not a scientist. You're not supposed to figure out why. That's not your job. Uh, your job is to do mathematical equations. It's strange that in a field that's about the numbers and about the theory, how a personality can change things. Absolutely, and no better example than quantum mechanics, really. And Niels Bohr who was sort of Einstein's counterpart on the other side. Oh. Yeah, loop-de-doo versus bull loop de doer uh, Well, anyway, when Einstein's arguing with Bohr, at least he was arguing from a um, non-quantum mechanical perspective, you could argue. Um, but again, the, the whole Bohr model was wrong. The electron spinning around thing doesn't make any sense. I don't know why they keep trying to make it make sense. It doesn't make any sense. It's not going to hold atoms together. Atoms are held together by charge. And charge is essentially when you have two charges in an, in an equation, a positive and a negative, you have a dipole, you have a magnet. Magnetism is holding atoms together, not spinning crap. Or clearly a genius, did absolutely central work in establishing quantum mechanics. He was the one who figured out, you know, that electrons come in certain orbits and not other orbits, which was a crucial step. Um, so, so again, certain distances, that the magnets have to be at certain distances, okay, for you to create an equilibrium between the forces. And if they're in some non-distance, it won't work because the electrons repel each other. So it's just like the, the iron filings, right? The iron filings have these little rows. What's creating the little rows? The little rows are being created by the fact that the magnets are repelling each other. The magnets are all lined up in the same way because they're being created by the original magnet. So the original magnet creates little magnets pointing in exactly the opposite direction in rows. And those rows can't get close to each other because those rows are the same magnet. And they're repelling each other. And the same is true for the electrons in an atom. There's a nucleus, yes, okay, full of attractive in terms of its, the opposite charge. And the electrons have to establish a position from that charge where their repulsion to each other is balanced against their attraction to the proton. And so they will, just like the metal filings around the magnet, they're only going to be able to be in balance at certain distances from each other. Period. You know, it's a magnetic... Uh, like I said, the magnet shows you the rings, it shows you the pattern. It shows you right in front of your face. It's sitting there showing you exactly why there's orbits for electrons because the freaking atom is a magnet. His, and, and he was a very different personality than Einstein, much more charismatic, gregarious, social. He worked with people. He founded a school and an institute. He had acolytes and followers. Einstein, much more of a loner, just kind of wanted to do his own thing, be left alone. It doesn't matter because it's all about the coverage, the media, the, the spectacle. And that's all it was. And that was crazy. It's just drama whoring. Important to winning the marketing battle. When it came to the interpretation of quantum mechanics, Bohr said, like, okay, we're basically done, everything is fine. Right, right. So this is another famous story. Bohr, uh, Ar Einstein argues with Bohr. Einstein presents a pretty good spooky action argument about how your entanglement doesn't work, how it will fail. And Bohr counter-argues with a paper nobody understood, nobody could even tell you what it was saying, it was so incomprehensible. And then when they republish the article later in a journal, uh, they republished the papers in the wrong order, and nobody even noticed that the papers were in the wrong order. It was such an incomprehensible paper, it didn't matter. You could put page 6 and page 7, re reverse them, doesn't matter. And Bohr won the argument with uh, an argument nobody could understand. And that's the history, and it's tragic. It's something deeply obvious that that doesn't make any sense. You based your whole physics on a guy who actually lost the argument? Einstein and Schrodinger and other huge names said, no, we're not done. What are you talking about? 
and Bohr won clearly, decisively. Like he was the one the physics community went along with, and so it does matter. And I think that that's an example where it was a mistake. You know, like sometimes force of personality and charisma <laughs> and persuasiveness help. Oh, help. so you're conceding it's a mistake? Oh, what a surprise! And Einstein wasn't arguing that we're not done. He was arguing that your premise of your spooky action is nonsense, okay? That there's no ESP between these objects, that there's a mechanical reason why, uh, you know, that you made left and right hand gloves in the box. They don't become left and right hand gloves later. People accept difficult ideas. Sometimes they kind of hold them back from tackling different ideas, right? And I think I saw somewhere you assert that, like, since 1927, we haven't been as curious as we used to be yeah. about physics. Can you explain that? Well, about the foundation. Well, they were never curious. And the whole point is that they, back in 1937, they were already making up this idea that detecting photons in the two slit experiment. And they, they just made up a thought experiment and then pretended their thought experiment was a real experiment that somebody actually really did. When it never took place, when that isn't, you don't know what's going to happen because you never did the experiment. You're just give, telling us what you think will be the result based on your own theory being correct. But if your own theory isn't correct, then the result isn't going to be what you think it's going to be. I mean, right now they can do the experiment in the sense that they can now, they, they claim there's enough of this this uh, pattern created with, with um, atoms, you know, a clump of 50 atoms. And um, clearly you could detect where a clump of 50 atoms is, but they have the same theory that somehow it's never in uh, any position. It's a superimposed. So 50 atoms just pop in and out of reality, you know, and go wherever the hell they go based on doing some mathematical equation, and that'll tell them where they should be. But they aren't anywhere. I mean, when we know they're every, they're somewhere all the fucking time. They don't go somewhere. They're just as real as this this battery they're just as real the 50 atoms and they do real things they go to real places they don't just pop into existence over some here over here or something i mean again it's just something deeply obviously wrong with their whole freaking theory it's silly the quantum mechanics okay. in particular so we had this idea you know, put together by the late 1920s it was all there was a there was a system in place and that system had this statement that you know electrons or other quantum systems are waves when you're not looking at them and they look like particles when you are so the question is is that a way station is that a partial solution to the correct eventual solution or is that just it and the physics community decided that's it we're not going to ask questions about no, that. well, that's not what was that's not the argument the argument was clearly about spooky action all right, and that's why the phrase is famous. The argument was really about Schrodinger's cat. It's, there's a real argument about whether or not this silly idea that um, the cyanide capsule doesn't really drop and the cat doesn't really die and all of that crap it was just crap. It really does happen, okay? It's not in the two states. It's not alive and dead. Th those are silly ideas. And again, so they went to the trouble to point out how they're silly ideas, and yet the silly ideas prevail. Um, why? That's the question. And it's not about because we want to close the door on inquiry. They want to close the door on finding a rational answer because they are so in love with the irrational one. The silly answer of God is what they want. They want the woo. They're just, they're just fake and, and phonies in the sense that they, oh, we don't like the standard religions. They want a new woo religion. They're just the crystal chasers. They're just making up a new fake religion. What's really going on under the <laughs> Fake religion. It's almost oxymoronic. They're, they're doing it in spite of what science says. Okay, in spite of the scientific method, in spite of what science says about having to be cautious and not make assumptions. They don't care about any of the rules of science. They're just throwing them away because they want to believe the mush. It's not going to worry about that. If you write a paper about the foundations of quantum mechanics, the journals will reject it. Uh, your colleagues will look at you as if, oh, it's too bad you no longer do real serious work anymore. Um, there's example after example of people either you know, being told not to do this or people who already have... Right. So, so you're just saying there's example of example that you created a church and you create a bunch of high priests that are going to dictate to you what they're allowed to find, what you're allowed to discover. And if you discover it in the wrong way, it'll just end up as a little book, you know, 
that nobody pays any attention to, um, like uh, Mendelssohn, for example, right in the peas, right? I mean, it wasn't until like 50 years after he documented all that stuff that somebody figured out, hey, there's a book documenting all this. Because, yeah, the, the priest said, no, that's not the story we want to tell, that, you know, there's genetics, you know, that there's there's some idea that the crooked pea is going to create a crooked pea son. Oh, we don't want to hear that. Because we're all special little spiritual animals. They're doing the same freaking thing. He's admitting it. We're censoring the discussion. We're controlling it. We're limiting it. We're telling you you can't you can't go against our the Catholic Church, and if you do, we'll shut you up. We'll make sure you're not heard. Established careers hiding from their colleagues, the fact that they were working on the foundation's quantum mechanics. I think it's finally changing. I think that, you know, both we're kind of stuck in fundamental physics in certain ways right now, but also for, again, technological advances have brought us to the point where we're building quantum computers and the need to truly understand... You're saying you're doing it, right. So there's no evidence that you're building anything called a quantum computer that's based on any of the quantum science. There's no evidence that you're advanced anywhere. You're getting anywhere close. You just keep talking about it like this magical thing. Just like your silly lensing thing where you're going to see further into space and do all this. You're never going to do any of that stuff because your theory is junk. Quantum mechanics is front and center, so people are beginning to take that problem a little bit more seriously. It only took us 100 years. Only took 90 years, 90 years, let's be fair, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's... So he's saying it's so much more open now. It's not even close, okay? These, these clowns don't argue with each other about anything meaningful, except, uh, you know, they might argue string theory or something, and you know, but... Yeah, there's no there's no getting to the foundations of physics. They're just arguing about whether there should be a Holy Ghost or not. Well, should we let the Holy Ghost sit next to God or not? Should entanglement be right next to wave or you know, should entanglement should we stick somebody in between? Maybe a Jesus. We'll put Jesus in between the Holy Ghost and God. Yeah, that'll be much better. Strange, but also from what I understand about academia is that it is kind of these weird it's a weird club in that sense where you can't bring this up and you have to do this to do this and to the disappointment i mean in a weird way it's the opposite of the free market well it's it's there is a free market there but it's a free market so this sort of uh, something i thought about in terms of trying to present these alternatives i mean i pointed out a really rational theory for um polarization of light and so that's one part but the truth is is they can't accept the one part unless you give them the other parts and so that's the real you know another stumbling block here is that I actually have to put the whole giant thing together. I can't present it and say, look, there's, you know, I made these cupcakes that are really good and these cookies are really good. All right, these little wafer bars, they're not so good. I haven't quite got them right. And so, but there's no serving any of these things as individual bits. You have to serve it as the whole meal. So you either give them the whole um, um, thing perfectly done so they can't pick at anything because you've given them anything to pick at, they'll pick at it. I mean, that's all they are, is nitpickers. They, they, they have no ability to defend their own silly assumptions and notions, but they have every ability to pick at one flaw in something that will be the, the replacement for their theory. And so even though there's no flaw, essentially, in the new photon theory, I would argue it really does explain photons so much better and explains what interference is, which really is an interference. You either constructively put a photon back together or you don't put it back together. There's no destructive anywhere. Get up ideas and you have to persuade people that your idea is worth following. And the, just like the free market... It's not that you're just, you know, doing an experiment and collecting data. You're trying to affect people's opinions, right? You're trying to, if you're in the free market, you want to, people to buy your product. And there's something called advertising. You know, uh, right, right. There's something called lying and exaggerating and nonsense. So why is he saying that science should be that way? <laughs> science shouldn't be that way. Science should have something called integrity. It should actually require people to prove what they're going to claim. Oh, I can cure your... You know, I mean, this is, they're saying, no, no, science is just as, as full of crap. It's just as, as lowbrow as advertising. And it shouldn't be. It should be way above that. There's supply and demand, but you can try to generate the demand. It's not just there as an objective fact. It's exactly the same thing in academia. You have an idea, your idea may or may not be right, but you certainly have to sell your idea. You certainly have to convince people that your idea is interesting. And... 
Ideally, the best ideas win, and I think in the long term, the best ideas win. All oh, right, right. I would agree, but it, it, the fact that this long term takes so pathetically long, I mean, again, and the fact that you lose all memory, apparently, of what somebody else already invented. I mean, uh, Newton already invented the cupcake of wave interference, of, of photon interference. He invented that cupcake. It's all him. And then a the guy shows up 100 and whatever years later, 50 years later, and says, uh, here, I invented the cupcake, the two-slit experiment. <laughs> you know, when Newton had already done the surface experiments, the interior surface and the exterior surfaces, he would already done the experiment. He already played with this. And the, the, the very fact that, look, my rational description of the slit experiments as surface experiments, that simple little change is, you know, dramatically more reasonable than their understanding that somehow it matters how open or closed it is or how further or how thick the needle is the reason why it matters because it's all about the distance between the surfaces the distance between the surfaces is why the same math works for exterior surfaces as it works for interior surfaces the reason why the math works is because it's about how far apart the surfaces are I mean that improvement, that one improvement in understanding should on its own be something physics says, ah, yes, that's so obvious now. Yes, we get it. That was hidden, <laughs> uh, that simple truth. And here it was, right in your own mathematics. Why, why does the same, why do you get to label a different variable, a different distance, the same thing, and the math works in both cases? Why? Because the distance just represents how far apart the surfaces are. Uh, and it's, you know, look how difficult it is to make the argument. That one little thing is a huge improvement in their understanding of what's happening in those experiments. Uh, but the consequence of accepting that simple, obvious, unhidden truth um, is that, oh, well, then this random thing we're thinking about doesn't mean anything, right? This really isn't about some sort of... Um, everything doesn't know where it is thing. It really does matter how close the photon is to a surface when it goes through the slit. <laughs> that makes a difference. And that they can't accept because that blows up their, their part of their woo. Moment to moment, a good idea can really struggle. Right. Talk about the Hadrian Collider because I think that's something that everyone watches. Hadrian. <laughs> I never call it. I heard it called the Hadrian. Hadrian. It's going to be some girl's name now, right? Hadrian. They see, and I think most people would say, you know, they're obviously looking into some quantum aspects and some atomic level stuff. What what have we learned from the Collider and what have we learned? Uh, I mean, I don't even know. You know. I guess I won't bother with that, right? Because that's just such woo bullshit, right? Things that don't last more than a millisecond of existence. And it just has to, again, it just has to do with energy moving through uh, a system. So you have the cloud chamber idea and you're just... You're going to excite bits of atoms, and it's going to give you a trail, and so you'll understand the energy that must have gone through to create that trail, blah, 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 blah. And it's all based on their non-understanding of what energy is, that energy is something pushing things, that things move because they're being pushed, and they're being pushed by a force that's still pushing them, maybe. And um, the force has a length of ray, and the ray length is going to... To, it's going to decide how far the thing can possibly go, how much momentum it can have or will have. And again, every time something has a little bit different momentum, they call it a new kind of particle. And it's not anything new. It's just being pushed a little different. But anyway, no point in going through all that crap. So, uh, in summation, what is there to say, right? Uh, this is just the standard bullshit. Mr. Bullshit talking to Mr. Bullshit you know, about their bullshit. And <laughs> this, this runs the world, and everybody falls for this crap for reasons I can't understand entirely. But I did see a phrase where some, so some slogan you put on a T-shirt, um, you know, um, I can explain it, but I can't make you understand it. Yeah. I can only do my part here, you know, and give you a better explanation, a more reasonable one, one that's, more consistent with the evidence. Um, no, I can't make you reasonable, unfortunately. And it's really depressing because you seem to be belligerently unreasonable.
you just don't even want to have the conversation. Some asshole commented because I had rings on my fingers. Yeah, it's just incidental. You know, just happened to get a bunch of Chinese crap that fell into my hands, so to speak. And so I'm wearing them because I have them. <laughs> and they sort of fit, mostly. So what? I mean, you, you people are distracted by absolute bullshit is important to you. Just absolute bullshit. Uh, you know, you have no interest in anything, any accurate describing of reality. You just just want a fake bullshit story to live by. A bunch of lies. Pathetic. Ugh. So, yeah, there's nothing <laughs> You're just proud consumers of junk food. Proud. Pathetic. Fat in body and mind. So, anyway. That'd be all. Yeah. Ah, pretty pictures. Pretty. All right, anyway. <laughs> Next time. <sighs> Doing the same thing you fatheads are doing. Anyway, till next time and such. I don't really know what that is. I don't know whether it's white blood cells attacking cancer or what the hell it is. But anyway, who cares?